Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Derek Young and Drew Galloway. And as we continue on throughout this football offseason, we've talked quarterback, we've talked plenty of things going on with K-State football, who just added a new transfer quarterback today, so you can go check that out over at KSO. But we're going to talk Big 12 coaches today and see where things are at, because the Big 12, as they've expanded to 16, I know this is a shocker. They now have more coaches in the league than they did last season. But really, they have a really good stable of guys that I think are some of the best coaches in college football. And a lot of these guys have proven it now over a handful of years. Some of the guys that are on this list, they have some really good ups. They have some really big downs. They're in new places. Like There's a lot to get into. But I think the Big 12 is in a really good place with coaches. And as we see kind of the changing of the guard and a lot of other places where guys are getting out of it. You know, Harbaugh just went back to the NFL. Saban's done coaching. Uh, Dabo Swain, I don't think anybody takes him seriously as a head coach in college football anymore. Like, you're looking for all these new guys that can kind of be uh, w- when somebody's just scrambling to throw out, you know, that's a really good coach. I think the Big 12 is home to a lot of them right now. And we'll dive into kind of where we think of everything. But if I had to ask each of you right now who you thought the best coach in the Big 12 was, it doesn't have to be the most successful, but just however you want to quantify the best coach in the Big 12, who are you picking? And I know that's a loaded question to start off with, but I think that kind of highlights just how impressive what the Big 12 has going on right now is. So, uh, Drew, I love giving you the tough questions to start, so I'm going to let D.Y. go first here. Oh, yeah. Ooh, the fake that's out. Cool. Nice little curveball. Uh, I I jump four jump out to me as choices that I would make, and, I, and I'll just kind of like talk my way through it to give myself time to pick one. So it's almost like showing my work a little bit, but gives me extra time. That's what the pros do, I think. Um, Chris Kleiman's up there, in my opinion. He's won a Big Twelve title already. Um, uh, he's won national titles before that at the FCS level. I think he's proven. And he's built a consistent winner at a place that, you know, although they were a consistent winner at Bill, uh, under Bill Snyder, it's not the most easiest place to be a consistent winner. And he's continued what Snyder has done and even elevated the the latter years of Bill Snyder by, you know, establishing a roster capable of winning the Big 12 championship and really being on essentially the doorstep of another because this team last year was worthy of being a Big 12 title, Big 12 champion. And, Maybe they're a player of two away of being in the Big 12 championship if they just come up with the the final plays against Texas, right? Or, you know, don't collapse at home against Iowa State on top of that, of course. But, you know, that's me showing my work on, on Chris Kleiman. Kyle Whittingham, I know he's hasn't even coached a game in the Big 12, but I don't think you can you build out a top three or four without him, what he's done at Utah. Um, and, again, a consistent winner. And, and his consistent winning is probably – even a little bit a higher of a ceiling. Like he's, they've eclipsed some certain things, you know, a lot of 10 win seasons, multiple power, power five conference championships or on the doorstep of those anyway. So he's got to be on there. Mike Gundy. Um, I don't think he can have a list of the top three or four without him. He just almost won another big 12 last year, which I think on paper, we would all agree. It's kind of one of his most lackluster teams. He had a complete quarterback catastrophe at the beginning of the season and somehow turns that team into one that goes to Arlington. I think that speaks for itself. I know these waning years, they seem less talented, but you can't push them down the list when he just plays for a Big 12 title a year ago. And the last one is another guy that has not coached in the Big 12 yet, and that's Willie Fritz. And I know I'm jumping the gun a little bit there, but – Almost kind of like Lance Leipold, and I know I didn't put Leipold in there, and Fritz is probably fourth out of these four, probably similar to Lance Leipold. They don't have the substantial accomplishment, although he did take Tulane to a you know a, a New Year's Six Bowl. They don't have that huge championship to like point to as why they're a great coach, but you just know they're a great coach because of what they have done and how they've turned programs around and basically won everywhere they have been. So Fritz and Leipold, kind of the same thing. So for me, it would come down to Gundy, Kleiman, and Whittingham. I will probably take Kyle Whittingham just because I think he's won at a high level more often than both Kleiman and, and Gundy at this point. And I would probably have Gundy too 
to be honest, because I want to put Kleiman over Gundy, but I think Kleiman had a better team last year, and Gundy's the one that played for a Big 12 championship. You're muted. I, I, I can't disagree with any of that. What I look at is I have, you know, I, we're going we're gonna to do fraud watch at the end of this. Uh, mm -hmm. I have five guys in the best category that you can be in. Uh, f four of those guys, the four guys you said they are in there. And I, th I think Kyle Whittingham is the guy, though, because, number one, I mean, the longevity of what he's done. He's been uh, a, a full-time head coach at Utah since 2005. And he took over, obviously, after Urban Meyer, who built Utah into what they were at yep. that time in the Mountain West. And he sustained it where, you know, a lot of times, like, I, it, you come in after that guy, you can have that little run after, and then it's on you. What that program does is on you. And what he did was in his fourth fourth full season there, they go unbeaten, they win the Sugar Bowl, uh, and then they win. They have back to back ten win seasons after that. Then that's when they make the move to the Pac-12. But they make that move, and it takes a little bit to get going there. They struggle the first handful of years in the Pac-12, some below five hundred seasons, not in the top twenty five. But then pretty soon he finds a way to reinvent himself again, like. Really, Kyle Whittingham and some of these other coaches that are making jumps, not to the same extent, it's like they've taken a new job despite staying at the same place. So they're comfortable with what they're doing, but you know what you're doing to win in the Mountain West is different than what you have to do to win in the Pac-12. And Whittingham was able to adjust a second time around and come in and you know all these 10-win seasons, the back-to-back -back Rose Bowl appearances is certainly the peak of it. And I also think that he's elevated the – the recruiting element and area that Utah can be involved in where Utah can be a serious player at times for high end guys that, uh, you know, they probably never would have been in the past. So I think just because of how long he's done it and the fact that he's been able to kind of re kind of reinvent, uh, I think it's Kyle Whittingham, but I also like, I think people want to bestow it upon him because Utah is kind of the team that's hot in the streets right now over the last few years. But I think he can be caught by anybody that's in the Big 12 right now uh, that's in you know the top probably five or six coaches in the league. But uh, I think you'd be silly not to give it to him. Mike Gundy, I mean, he, he deserves to be up there because he impressed last year. But it just – it feels like that thing is built on such unstable footing because the pieces last year really shouldn't have worked. So I guess thank you to Ollie Gordon if you're Mike Gundy. Uh, and you, you just kind of hope that it works again this season because – it very easily couldn't, and we haven't seen them be um, at the same consistent level. Some really good ups, and then hey, they're going to go to their their seven win floor. But uh, I I just I'm not fully convinced on the Gundy train moving forward. Moving yeah, forward, this is going to be a uh, pretty yeah. yeah moving forward. Uh, who knows with <laughs> them? But it's going to be pretty boring to start because I'm also on the Kyle Whittingham train, like. It's like you guys have said, he just has such sustained success in two different conferences and moving Utah to the power level. And it just seems like their floor is safer and is less volatile right now than like Oklahoma State, because it, you have to go back to 2013 since the last time uh, that Utah had a full real season, because 2020 for the Pac-12 was even more of a mess that, that uh, Utah only had uh, five or less wins. So I think that you add that uh, Utah's made the pack, made the pack 12 title game five times. Utah won it twice. And then last year, I mean, you can argue that they would have at least been in contention with Oregon and Washington if Cam rising was, you know, functioning. So I, I think that the sustained success that he's had, but, but I think that Gundy is probably my number two, just because going to the big 12, title game to the last three years is nothing to really sneeze about. And I think that that is probably what sets him apart from like Chris Klein and Willie Fritz, Lance Leipold. He was one, he was, he was a game away, a yard away, right. From being mm -hmm. in the playoff. Uh, yeah. Look, I'm with Mason. If you're, if you're asking me to project forward, probably not as high on Oklahoma state as a program. No. Um, just because the recruiting doesn't seem to be as prolific as it once was as well. And it kind of looked like they're kind of doing this with like bubble gum and sticks. I get it. Yeah. But I, I don't think that takes away my gut. What's my gun is as a coach. No, no, it, it definitely shouldn't. And he obviously he, he knows what he's doing and he gets the most out of the guys. 
once they're there, even, you know, if some people want to kind of freak out about how it gets done at times, um, there's certainly a lot of old school to how Mike Gundy does it, but I think that works at a place like Oklahoma state. And I also think like the, the people that end up in that position, there, the players. I think they kind of like to have the mentality of like, Hey, we're just going to have to be tougher than everybody. But you're right. The recruiting thing is interesting because uh, they were 10th in the big 12 in 2024 in terms of their recruiting, uh, which is behind teams like Arizona state and West Virginia. Um, so it's going to be kind of interesting to see how they adjust moving forward and, and where things go now. And I throw up there, you know, the, all the win percentages of the current coaches in the league. So it's ordered there for you. Um, certainly some of it, you can go in and tell a story and be like, well, you know, Scott Satterfield did a lot of that damage at app state. Uh, you go and look at a guy like Willie Fritz. We know that there's been some really high highs at Tulane and I don't think you can deny what he was able to build him into, but also like, you know, he had a hurricane season in there uh, that really screwed things up for Tulane, and they had a, like a really nasty 2021. So there are a lot of different things that you can throw in to quantify these people. Lance Leipold had a jump start two programs that he took over, um, and Chris Kleiman only, you know, he, he hell of his North Dakota State stuff doesn't transfer over because this is just FBS Division One stuff. But what does a guy like Chris Kleiman have to do, and can he – move past some of these guys that we've talked about, Mike Gundy and Kyle Whittingham, because I do think that there is a substantial lead right now. Like you could make the argument that Chris Kleiman might be the best coach in the league right now, or Lance Leipold might be the best coach in the league. But at some point, because of how you judge these things, like there has to be the winning that is done with it. So Mike Gundy and Kyle Whittingham, they have the accolades and they aren't slowing down yet. What would have to happen for Chris Kleiman to jump into the driver's seat to be the best coach in the league because I think there's a realistic scenario where five years from now you could say he's the best coach in the league even if some of these guys are still around well I think we'll just put it this way if if, if Oklahoma State's kind of who we expect them to be this year and Kansas State is as well and we'll say they win the big 12 like I might be tempted to go climbing over Gundy in the current, not saying that he's had a better career or more championships like that, but then I think if you're looking at current, well, he like, has he, had more championships than Mike Gundy for you know getting technical uh, yeah. football's football DY, <laughs> and, yeah, more and more 10 win seasons and stuff like that. Because I know Gundy went on that tear for five or six years, but we're enough removed from that that I think a climbing big 12 title this year would at least jump him over Gundy. Now Whittingham's a little bit of a different monster, I think, in terms of longevity and some of the successes that he has had at Utah. Um, but, I mean, even last year, I know that they didn't win anything substantial, right, last year. But to to even get where they got last year without Cam Rising was pretty impressive. And the year before that, they won, won the Pac-12, went to the Rose Bowl at Ohio State at full strength on the ropes, right? So, this <laughs> And just recently, they were real. I, I think, I think there's probably enough of a gap between Climate and Whittingham that I might not say I can jump Climate over Whittingham, even if he wins the Big Twelve this year. But if Kansas State were to win the Big Twelve this year, I think I'd be tempted to go Climate over Gundy. Yeah, I, I think that I would 100% agree with that. Another Big Twelve probably bumps him over Gundy because that would give him more Big Twelve championships than Mike Gundy's won. But Whittingham is just a different monster because of all the le- longevity. It probably takes multiple Big 12 titles for Chris Kleiman. And, and honestly, probably for Kyle Whittingham to not win one to jump Kyle Whittingham at this point. Yeah, yeah I mean, Utah did get one too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Utah is is up there with K-State. They, they, those are the top two teams in terms of odds to win the league this year. And like I think the other element to this is Kyle Whittingham, you know, the, the back-to-back Rose Bowls is a big deal. I, you know, Utah is considered a uh, – now it's a little different because of how you've had to restructure things with the playoff, but they've been considered a perennial New Year Six game candidate, and you show that by going to back-to-back Rose Bowls. K-State and Chris Kleiman have just been to one. I think that's where you have to jump into this thing too, where you have to be able to get there. And then really with the way the Big 12 is structured right now, it's also going to come down to who can win games when you get into the playoff, where it's not just getting in, but – can you win a game or two and extend yourself to get to, you know, what it's going to be to the to the top four or whatever that are left there with the semifinals? Because 
I mean, the only guy now in the the current setup that there is, Sonny Dykes is a guy that has that win, winning the Fiesta Bowl in the semifinal over Michigan. Um, but you know, there there's a lot to dive into with the the Sonny Dykes side of it too. Um, is it yeah. is it realistic to think that Chris Kleiman and K State uh, over the next couple of years they're going to even be in the position to where you can gain that ground on Kyle Whittingham? Because like you guys said, it's Kyle Whittingham has to slow down a little bit too, and we'll see. Maybe the Big Twelve affects that in some way, but like the top end of the Big Twelve is probably not what the top end of the Pac twelve was at times when you know Whittingham was winning it. Uh, but then also that's going to mean that K State has to be able to capitalize when the opportunity is there, or anybody else in the league that wants to take that mantle, whether it be Mike Gundy in Oklahoma State, or if it is you know Lance Leipold continues KU on the, the trajectory that they're on. Um, so is, is it a possibility that that can actually happen or are we talking like this is going to have to be a much longer down the line thing and also consider the fact that, you know, maybe Kyle Whittingham has to retire before anybody right. claims the throne as the best coach in the big 12 other than him. Yeah. I mean, I said, if, if K-State got it this year, I'd bump them over Gundy. If they got it the year after it went back to back, that'd be three big 12 titles in four years, right? Yes. Then, then you're equal to Whittingham or, or above him at that point. And I know what you were saying there, but I I just don't know if we can in the current structure and and in the structure moving forward. And and this is always for me just a, a tough topic to delve into because of what I kind of foresee it morphing into and what I which is kind of what I hope it doesn't. And if I'm right or not, I think I just think if you're going to get into the big, the playoff, if you're Kansas State or even Utah or Oklahoma State, and and you're just, unless you're just unfathomably more loaded than typical, right? Like, can you beat a Big Ten or SEC team? Because I just think that gap is going to get a little wider. It's real. I mean, it really depends on where you think this is going to go. If if the movement and everything that's gone on is going to get to the point where it's not just Alabama and Michigan and Ohio State that are I mean you know I think LSU will be in that category uh Washington Oregon whoever you want to throw if those schools they already probably have the talent advantage most of the time by a good margin to think it's going to be tough to get over the hump like we saw what it took for TCU to beat Michigan and it was a lot of big time errors by Michigan that just basically handed TCU points. And outside of that, like it's going to be tough. The concern, if you don't think that big 12 teams are going to be able to be successful is that the sec and big 10 being so much further ahead of the big 12 and the ACC and revenue now is that you're going to be able to see the teams like Penn state who I really haven't taken seriously. Like they're fine, but you play in a pretty crappy conference where if you avoid playing like two and a half teams, you're going to win 10 games and have a pretty good record. Are they going to be able to get the money that, hey, maybe their end of the season record looks the same as it always has, nine and three, 10 and two, but it's because of how big the Big Ten is now that when you do play a K State or a Utah, I don't go into that game thinking, hey, the Big 12 team, I think they, I think this is going to be a close game. I think this is a toss up where we have to end up looking at it and saying, nope. You know, Penn State's going to smash you. Uh, you know, Ole Miss is one of those in the SEC that seems to be on a good trajectory with Lane Kiffin. Are they going to be able to take advantage of the depth that's between the top two power conferences and the next two? Like, that's the kind of thing where I guess it would become concerning. And uh, would I mean, that, that's I get what you're saying and why it might be tougher to quantify uh, in terms of what these guys do postseason wise. And it really just comes down to how they handle who controls the Big 12 and wins the titles a majority of the time. That's kind of where I see it. Now, I don't know that the gap is so big already that maybe in the immediate you can't, you know, compete a little bit. Like if Utah ends up in a playoff against Oregon or Washington from the Big Ten now, right, they can probably hang, you would think, right now. Or, you know, at least it's a competitive game. They're probably not going to be the favorite. If Kansas State, we just saw it, right? Missouri would have been in the playoff last year. Kansas State had every chance to beat them. Now, is it how different does it look in the postseason, these playoff games and what they're going to be like? I don't know. Like, <coughs> excuse me, really bad at that. 
Kansas State, and in those situations, like the Big 12 champions probably going to be a home team, right? I, like I, I don't exactly know how it's structured. Like, is it like foreseeable that Missouri would have to play a road playoff game at K State? Like, is that a thing? Uh, I, I yeah. think that the top four get uh, like the, the, with the automatic qualifier that the second game is neutral, isn't it? So, but what, how are the buys? I, I so the, the, the buys, the the buys will go to the top four, the four highest ranked conference champions. It, that that almost hurts K State because yeah. I think the. Their biggest, their best chance of getting into a playoff is by winning the conference title, and if they win the conference title, you know, more often than not, the, the way the structure is now, they're one of the four best. So instead of a home game, right, they're going to get, get a, a new buy. Game. Yeah, yeah, that I mean that does make it tricky, and and I, like Missouri is a good example right now. We see that they're hoarding the talent; they are taking advantage of their standing in the SEC and making strides moving forward, like. We know that the gap between K-State and Missouri is not big right now. Maybe in terms of recruiting talent, some would say it is, but we know on field it isn't that big of a gap at this point in time. The question would be five years down into this process with the new playoff and everything, is that gap created and is it bigger? And, and it'll be interesting to see. But I, you're right. Like if the – with the automatic bids and the structure that that would work out if K-State or Utah or Oklahoma State or whoever else from the Big 12 gets in as that three or four seed, then they're sitting there, they get a buy, and then you have to play, you know, if you're the four, you're playing what I guess that would equate to probably like a like a five that would probably be waiting there for you. And then you're playing, you know, Notre Dame or LSU or Ohio Alabama. State or Michigan, Alabama. <laughs> like the possibilities are there. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, so, and, and and yeah, you lose your chance at a home game because yeah. also if you if the Big Twelve does get in that large team, I think they'll probably get one most of the time, maybe two, but most of the time it's gonna be one. You're probably not ranked five through eight, right? You're probably ranked nine through twelve. You're playing on the road. Yeah, yeah, and then you're you know you if you if you even win that first game, then you are playing whoever's at the top you know, Ohio State, Michigan, Georgia, Alabama, whatever it may end up being. So it's tough. I, it is tough to see going forward. And I think that's why most of it just is going to come down to you win it and you put yourself as a top four seed, like that's a significant accomplishment. And then people can judge from there. And then certainly if anybody was able to get themselves in a position where they have their program winning those games, uh, then you're going to put some serious distance between you and the next coach considered in this category, just because we see it as hard to do right now with the way that things are structured and how the things are going to work out for the big 12. So it's fascinating to think about. Uh, and we know that, you know, the big 12 is really all over the spectrum of coaching right now with guys that we think are probably some of the best in college football from a standpoint of what they're able to get on campus talent wise, but then what they're able to do with everybody and then if you want to flip to the total other side, you've got the people that are either unproven or you probably just think flat suck and aren't cut out for this. Uh, if if we were talking top coaches, who is at the bottom of the Big 12 in terms of you know respect or what you think that they can accomplish as a head coach? So, you know, maybe the better way to, to look at it is who has the lowest ceiling of a coach in the Big 12 right now? the lowest ceiling probably because of circumstances more than coaching chops. Cause I don't know what the coaching chops are, but the university is a disaster. The athletic department is a disaster. You just went through scandal that I think is costing you money and recruiting scholarships available. You got to say Dillingham. I, I think he might be able to coach a little bit and he's young and energetic but, man, Arizona State's almost an impossible spot right now just because of everything that is surrounding him at this point that's negating him from being a good coach. So I, I want to lean that. Now, if you took away his circumstances and just made me pick someone on their coaching chops, I, I would probably go Scott Satterfield, just not buying into that joker. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to go with the, the low-hanging fruit with Scott Satterfield. I just – I don't think that he's very good. I I think that Cincinnati just kind of felt like they panicked when they hired him because he was probably going to get fired at Louisville. I, I just don't think that he's very good. And 
their quarterback situation is still a disaster this season. And like, it's to the point where I, I usually, I think that we're in a world where two years is probably enough. And I think that if they don't get any better, he's probably unemployed at the end of the season. Yeah. S- Satterfield is the one where I, like Arizona state has plenty of stuff going on where they're in disarray, but I, I do think that there's a, a chance that Dillingham can coach. They are starting to be better at talent acquisition, even despite some of the you know issues that they have. Um, and I could see, you know, down the road, like if he has time, I could see Arizona state being a competitive program. Like they have plenty to sell down there. I just don't know how you sell Cincinnati if you're not a really good coach. And that was what the most disappointing thing about the Satterfield hire was because this entire time when Cincinnati was coming to the Big 12 and then uh, when they're looking for a coach, I kept saying, like, go look at the history of what Cincinnati has done. The people they have hired have been dynamite. They have not whiffed on a coaching hire in football for a long time because guys either have yeah great success there or they move on to a better job, like a really good job in most cases uh, for some of these guys. And I Satterfield, I just don't see it. Like it's a pretty, it's a pretty lukewarm move that they made. And obviously last year the results weren't good. And I I honestly think that them rolling with Emory Jones as their quarterback last year kind of shows how much of a joker that Satterfield is because there was a, there was no world that after like three or four games you should have been thinking, uh yeah, this is the best option for us. Like even if at the moment it looks worse if you go to somebody else playing quarterback for you that's still a better option because you think, Hey, we're going to do it a different way, different style, develop this guy a little bit more. Emory Jones, there was no reason why Emory Jones should have been playing for a crappy football team like that last year and just being allowed to suck for him. So I, yes, uh, the Cincinnati situation. I, I don't have a lot of faith or confidence in that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the last, there's a chance that they're worse this year. In yeah. the last 10 or 15 years, you talked about their coaching, like history, I mean, they went and got those young, sought-after coaches that were kind of blossoming, right? The Brian Kelly before he mm-hmm. became a big deal. Mark D'Antonio before he became a big deal. Luke Fickle before he became a big deal. Not like retreads, right? So here, real quick, here are the coaches since 2004 that since. Oh, yeah, okay, can I, can I say one thing? Yeah. You know what he's the most like in terms of coaching history? That Cincinnati is hired that I can remember in the last 15, 20 years. Tommy Tuberville, they both failed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean yeah. that's 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 a fair point. And he, that was and that was Tuberville's last stop. Like that was that's a that's a really good comp because honestly, Satterfield is a lot like what we see middling power conference teams do, and it's just you hire a retread that has done it before, but like you go, the ceiling's not very high with that guy. And that's certainly the case with with Satterfield. Yeah. But like Satterfield escaped Louisville before they could fire him. Yeah. Tommy Tuberville during a recruiting dinner. Remember at Texas Tech? Was it Texas Tech? He was like in a recruiting dinner. It's like, oh, I got a call. Left, never came back. Got hired as the Cincinnati coach. Yeah. Uh, so the the history there, like Mark D'Antonio, like you said, for three years, four seasons of Brian Kelly. So D'Antonio goes to Michigan State. Kelly goes to Notre Dame. Butch Jones, which, you know, say what you want about Butch Jones, but he parlayed it to being the head coach at Tennessee. And then, yeah, Tuberville sucked. Uh, And really, he wasn't he wasn't horrible at Cincinnati, but it was his last job. And again, that was just an uninspiring hire. And then the Luke Fickle thing was obviously dynamite for Cincinnati and took him to heights that they'll probably never get back to. Uh, And he was there for six seasons and was really good. So it just it doesn't make a ton of sense that the the Satterfield move happened. And I think if you're looking at guys that are candidates to probably not be there after this coming season, he would be one of them, like Drew said, where in college football, the cycle is pretty much just two years now. So, yeah. And, I, you know, if you're going to just talk hot seat in general, I'm sure I th- he comes Dave. across as a great, comes across as a great guy, but Kalani Sataki, BYU. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. he's, he's one of those guys that you have to wonder, like, the adjustment of going from being an independent to being in a conference, especially one this big and this deep, it it may catch up to you. And like, he's going to have to adjust. I think he has one of the tougher jobs in doing this now because he is going from not being in a conference. And so what you can achieve and what is thought of you is a lot different now. 
where like when BYU was an independent, you think, okay, well, the schedule is going to have a couple of really tough ones on here because, you know, they played USC almost every year. You're really like, you're not playing for much at BYU. If we're being honest, it's like rack up as many wins in conference play. And, you know, maybe you're an eight or nine win team and go to this bowl. But when you're in a conference, your number one goal, the first thing you should think of is winning a conference title. And Oklahoma State, I think, th they think that nonstop. Utah thinks that nonstop. I think UCF right now thinks that. K-State obviously does. Iowa State, they might be delusional, but they think that. And, you know, whatever. Joey McGuire is getting the talent to do it. Willie Fritz won a Cotton Bowl over USC at Tulane. He certainly can do it. Sonny Dykes was, you know, a goal line stand away from doing it and has won a college football playoff game. Lance Leipold is helping Kansas grow at an exponential rate. Baylor has won conference title games with different head coaches over the last decade. Um, so I think you have most of these schools, there is that realistic thought there, and that's what you want to achieve. I just don't know that, you know, you can adjust like that when you've been doing it a certain way for so long. So I agree as much as I uh, kind of like how Kalani Sataki rolls sometimes, I do think uh, he's probably just not going to get it to work out. So there's, there's probably three on the hot seat, right? Satterfield, Satake, and Aranda. Yeah, and Neil yeah. Brown. Yeah. I, th I think last year might have bought Neil Brown some time, but maybe. Yeah, we'll if, see. If they crash and burn and go like four and eight, three and nine, he's probably gone. Yeah. All right. Uh, last thing for you guys as we talk about coaching. No, we got to do this. Fraud watch. It will make its triumphant return throughout the regular season. But here is the Big 12 preseason fraud watch for everybody to keep in mind. Think about uh, what what you think where guys fall. And this is how I grade the the coaches and where they stand right now. You guys can tell me uh, any surprises, any disagreements on the list. Uh, for those only listening, uh, the fraud warning, and this goes on the National Weather Service scale. So, uh, you know, you've got your warnings, which means, oh, crap, uh, they this is really going to suck. Deion Sanders and Dave Aranda, as people know, I've been an anti-Dave Aranda guy for a long time. I have just said he's a fraud, he's a fraud, he's a fraud, and boom. He's actually the inspiration for why Fraud Watch started. Deion Sanders, there really isn't much that needs to be said about that guy. Like He is the biggest clown in college football right now uh, and pretty worthless as a, as a head coach. It's, you know, it's incredible when you're not at a lower level and you're able to get way more talent than anybody else in your vicinity can – you seem to just dominate everybody no matter what you do. doesn't work that way uh, when you're playing with the big boys. The fraud advisory. Th so this is elevated from a watch. Like Some stuff might go down, but it's not horrible yet. Sonny Dykes and Neil Brown. N and Neil Brown would not have been in this category last year. I didn't respect him enough to put him in this category. The problem for Neil Brown is he had too much success last season. So now he is a fraud advisory because he could fall back down to earth. And like I just said, hey, he might be uh, on the outs. Sonny Dykes, I mean, it's pretty easy to see why. You come in one-year wonder, you go to the national title game, and then losing record last season. Do you have a clear path to being good? I don't know. He's got a lot to prove this year to get off that list. Fraud watch. These are the last guys that, you know, as, uh, as Tom Hallion would say, uh, these guys, their ass is in the jackpot. This is the last one of these guys. Joey McGuire, the Texas Tech head coach, Matt Campbell at Iowa State, and Gus Malzahn. Joey McGuire, he talks the talk, and a lot of guys buy into it. I am one of those guys that buys into it. But at some point, last year was a little disappointing. They recovered pretty well. But this is a big year for Joey McGuire and Texas Tech, especially since they're starting to acquire more and more talent down there. Uh, one of the top two recruiting teams in the Big 12 right now in terms of their talent. Gus Malzahn falls into that same boat. He got that extension last year. We laughed at when it came because UCF was struggling. They are getting a lot of love right now. They added K.J. Jefferson. R.J. Harvey is one of the best running backs in the Big 12. There's talent there at UCF. Gus Malzahn has to come through with it. And then Matt Campbell. I mean, this probably isn't Matt Campbell's fault. He's at a school that uh, has very rarely achieved anything of significance uh, really in their history, but their fans for some reason think that he is God's gift to earth. And I would think that if that was the case, that maybe in a year where people are healthy and not dealing with uh, 
a global pandemic that maybe they'd find a way to win nine games or something. So, Matt Campbell, it's time to get going here or uh, you're going to go deeper down the fraud watch side. So, with those three categories, uh, any disagreements or hate that you guys would like to send my way? Not really. The only thing I would say is if I was going to quibble at all, and to be honest, I think I would have laid it out as exactly the way you did, is that there's a part of me that thinks Joey McGuire is going to be flipping over into advisory rather quickly. Good. Mm -hmm. I see who you didn't respect enough to put as a, a watch advisory or warning. So I, I respect it. I, I like the list. I, I, I kind of agree that Joey McGuire probably might be trending towards advisory. Joey McGuire, he, he's he's probably the most snake oil salesman feel of the Big 12 right now. Uh, the thing with him is that I think to not continue to soar up those fraud rankings is that Texas tech has to have a really good year. And I'm still not sure if they're built to do that, even though that they have been accumulating this talent be more so because I assume that they're pretty good at around the position, both offensively and defensively. I guess I'd have to dig into it a little bit, but just, you know, and you, you know, we're at in football. It's like, you're only, you, you have a, finite ceiling if you haven't figured out the quarterback position yeah yep it'll yeah. be interesting with baron morton there this year so those are the guys, the spring. yeah he could play so those Wait. are the guys that are watch advisory warning go ahead drew i was gonna say baron morton also didn't survive the spring without yeah. getting hurt well, so like, <laughs> he's got he's got arm talent but like every other red raider in the last five to ten years made a glass yeah, but shout out to Jake Strong for the Tech game last year, though. Yeah, boy, yeah, that was that was a good time for everybody uh, in purple. All right, <laughs> uh, the other side of this right here. So the the category right there between the watch and the studs, uh, it's they're, you're either mediocre or it's too early to tell. And if you're watching, you can probably guess which two guys it's too early to tell on, yeah, and yeah, which yeah. guys I just probably don't really respect right now, and I think they're mediocre. Uh, Kalani Sataki and Scott Satterfield. I, you don't belong in the the fraud watch categories because I just don't know that you're good enough to get there. Uh, Brent Brennan and Kenny Dillingham, you're new on the job at two schools that are dysfunctional for different reasons. Arizona's missing like a bunch of money in their athletic department, and Arizona State they had guys running their school and athletic department that didn't like athletics. It would seem. Uh, they did, you know, they they just hired an AD yesterday, I believe. So uh, we'll see where things go. He's trying to turn it around. It's a tough job, so he's going to get some time. I'm not going to put him on the. He's got a he's got a grace period here. He won't be on the fraud watch for a while. Yeah. Then the studs. These are guys that we talked about early on. Uh, the only guy that I threw on there that wasn't in DY's top four was Lance Leipold. I just think you have to respect the yeah. the job that he's done. But I get where you were coming from. You were, you know, he doesn't have the accolades there yet, but he certainly has the juice from building a roster and building talent. So Chris Kleiman, Lance Leipold, Willie Fritz, Mike Gundy, Kyle Whittingham, they're studs. And they also have a lot of a lot of ways that things would have to go wrong for them to to move off of that category after this year. Yeah, I, I would just have Fritz and Leipold so similar. So I don't think you can have one without the other at this point. I think they're almost mere images of each other when it comes to performance, career. I think I think they're close in age at this point, too. So it makes sense to include Leipold in that. For the Sataki and Satterfield argument, exactly where I would have put them. But I don't know if it's – well, obviously it's not too early on them. But I don't know if it's that they're mediocre. It's that everyone – there's no one clamoring that they might be good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it, they should be in a separate category just called, like, ass. People already <laughs> people already know you suck. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, it's funny. You, you talk about Leipold and Fritz. Uh, yeah, they're, they're four years apart in age. Fritz is 64. Leipold is 60. They also both kind of look similar. Like, if – like, there's – you could look at it and go, oh, hey, those guys might be brothers or like half brothers or something. Yeah, uh, but it's it's very easy to group those two together. Yeah, yeah, and they've they All both coaches. obviously yep. parlayed small school success into to jobs that you know in a in the Big Twelve that Leipold has turned KU into a good program, and Fritz uh, certainly you 
would expect that he does that at Houston. It will be interesting on the Willie Fritz thing, though, because a lot of this is based off of what he did at Tulane. How quickly is he going to have to start showing signs of success at Houston? And if things go wrong, I mean, is it okay to be heavily critical of Houston? Because you did you did hire a guy that's 64 already. Like, that's, that's not young. And that's not me saying that 64-year-old coaches can't do it. We know that they can. But most of the time, it's because they've been there for like 10 years already and they've got this thing rolling. 64-year-olds starting new at a new program and a new level – you could see how it easily wouldn't go well. <laughs> if it didn't go well, I don't think I would criticize Houston for doing it. I think it was a still a swing we're taking. Who else? I mean, you go pay a huge buyout to UTSA to get Jeff Trailer, or do you get a guy that's probably as good or better than Jeff Trailer, just might be older, and you don't have a huge buy- buyout? So... I get when you say when something doesn't go well, people just want to criticize and say you're stupid, you messed up, it was a mistake. Well, I like this that. is one of those this is one of those <laughs> cases where I I think that even if it doesn't work out, it still wasn't a mistake. I think this was a decision that needed to be made. I still would be surprised if it didn't work out or is considered a mistake. How quickly we'll know, I don't know. But Willie Fritz does strike me as a guy that could probably start winning at a fairly decent level pretty quickly at Houston. Now, there's really no mystique or nostalgia or tradition associated with him that he could just sell it because it's Houston. But what he does have in his favor, I would imagine, is like you could throw a stone, you know, being in Texas and probably hit 20 really good college potential college football players. It's true. Joey McGuire's doing it. Yeah, I I would say probably next year, if you really want to be like overly critical, it's probably like the year that if Houston is still like three and nine, four and eight, five and seven, that you probably have a little bit of a pause. What he needs, what what he needs to be doing now more than anything, is getting his quarterback in the future. I realize he walked into a situation where it's like, you know, whatever, we'll go Donovan Smith in year one. There's not a great alternative. It's kind of like Chris Kleiman. I know he got multiple years of him, but he's like. We'll just go with Skylar Thompson. Makes sense. Let's do it. It's kind of like the same thing with Fritz and Donovan Smith. But what he needs to do is find that bona fide guy right after him. Yeah, that, yeah. and that'll be interesting to see because that that is the spot to get it. Because talent-wise in Texas, you can find the, the receivers and the running backs and a lot of the other positions that are either – under recruited or you know there's just not enough spot for all you know the talent that's there to go to some of the bigger schools in the state so that's the easy part but quarterback there is still a finite amount of those guys that can do this at a high level so uh it'll it'll be interesting to kind of see how it plays out and what they you know end up going through and doing um they they did take they they didn't take a high school quarterback in the 2024 class they did get a transfer from louisiana uh, but like that's that's not going to do it for you. So it'll be interesting to see who they land in 2025, and uh, that probably is going to be your best indicator of of what success might come for Houston. The issue being that they took a transfer that you tend to think is not going to amount to anything and yeah. didn't take a high school quarterback in 24. So if you look beyond – to the 2025 season, if you don't have anyone on your roster that's really ready to go, you're kind of behind the eight ball. You got to hit, you got to hit the lottery in the transfer portal. Probably is what yeah. I imagine mm-hmm. Houston will have to do. I don't know if you wanted to do an, an exercise on any other coaches, but I'd like to dig into Sonny Dykes a bit, to be quite honest. Yeah, go for <laughs> it. You let's take away, like, how many good years that TCU has, has he had? Was it? Kind well, he's only been there two years. Oh, he's, he's had one. Okay. And he's had right. one really bad year. <laughs> right. So there you go. The, the one really bad year. So, and you look, he was solid at SMU. I don't know if I would say elite, right? Solid. He was solid. And he was a disaster at Cal. Like, yeah. I, I said that uh, Joey McGuire was in danger of being quickly in the advisory area. And I, I believe that. Just because I think if you have another average year, if you're if you're um, Joey McGuire, then you're like, is this really the guy? So you go to advisory. 
Like yeah. Sonny Dykes, I think is in the next category that is in probably the most immediate danger of going into complete warning yeah. you are a fraud. Because if you look at his career, the outlier is not the struggles or or just being average. The outlier is the great year because you have done nothing remotely close to that otherwise. Yeah, and look, their their schedule this year has some serious ups and downs to it, but it really it's not the easiest. So uh, in in all this, they're going to start on the road on a Friday at Stanford. Stanford's probably not going to be anything special. But their first Big 12 game comes in week three. They play UCF. They are at Kansas. They are at Utah this year. Home game against Tech. Home games against Oklahoma State and Arizona as well. So there are some certainly easy ones out there like Baylor and Cincinnati that pop up in league play. Um, but the really the only team that you avoided in the Big 12 is K-State this coming season. Everybody else, like you're, you're probably not going to be favored in a lot of those games, especially given what happened last year. And we just talked quarterbacks like yeah, we don't think that they have one of the 10 best quarterbacks in the Big 12 right now. And yeah. quarterback is key to winning. Yeah, Josh yeah. Huber, not top half. And I guess my final thing before I let Drew get a point across, and maybe he's going to talk about the schedule a little bit more, is you brought up those winning percentages by each coach. You take away that national championship a year, is Sonny Dykes below 500. He gets close to it probably. Yeah, if you yeah. so if you if you say you know hey Sonny Dykes was averaging whatever um yeah he he would be a little bit lower down on there uh, i would take it down a, somewhat so yeah i, I, I mean yeah i'm doing quick math here so he would have been it'd be 76 and 70 if you take away the 2022 season yeah so just, that's yeah. a pretty drastic difference between the 89 and 72 that he is right now yeah that's i think that spells it out i i think he's probably a lot closer to average coach than he is to good coach yeah yeah uh, and the the thing that I'd noticed with the schedule that you were talking about, like you point out the probably easier games are the Baylor and Cincinnati games, but both of those are on the road. True. Like the, their home their home games are the ones against Arizona, Oklahoma State, and uh, and then they have a home game against uh, UCF. Like those three games, not easy. Yeah, and their the easiest road- home game this season is a Friday night against against Houston, who we just talked about has one of the five best coaches in the Big 12 probably. Yeah, their their schedule's not easy. Like it they're going to be a team that's probably in that 6 and 6, 7 and 5, 5 and 7 area. Although, if you want to get your ceiling, you'd rather have your tougher games at home, I guess. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. So, I don't know, we'll see uh, where it goes, but yeah, Sonny Dykes is probably one of the most interesting because he, out of the new coaches, he has the best accomplishment out of any of them. He has played for a national championship, but outside of that, you wonder what's going on. And last year was not pretty for them. And again, like the talent that was on that team, most of them showed up there via Gary Patterson. And look, Gary Patterson obviously had lost his touch, much like what some of us were thinking that Mike Gundy had happened. Gundy clearly hasn't gotten to that level yet. So Patterson was still getting some of the talent there. He just wasn't able to put it together. Sonny Dykes, he put it together for one year, but now you have to get those guys in there. And like we talked about, Josh Hoover doesn't seem like the quarterback that you that you need to get it done. Tough does, question. Does, does TCU make the playoff and make the national championship game if Chandler Morris doesn't get hurt against Colorado? Uh, no, mm-hmm. no, because they yeah they were not going to switch that early. So tough. The, tough. The, that I think that that kind of answers for around Sonny Dykes. Yeah, probably. That's a, that's a good detail. Tough question here. Uh, it's probably going to be like a like you got to pick like which one of the gross ones you like the most here, right? <laughs> who would you rather? Who would you rather hire? You're an AD. You're gonna you gotta hire someone today. Um, Neil Brown, Matt Campbell, Joey McGuire, Sonny Dykes, Dave Aranda. Mm. Oh man. <laughs> I I would probably I think I think Joey McGuire is still the number one option there because he is acquiring the talent. And again, like year one, they won eight games. Last year they still won like seven or eight. Like they just had some bad gross losses for themselves. So like it's not as bad as it could be with Joey McGuire, but 
it's there's a lot of talk. Now you got to back it up. Uh, number two would still be Matt Campbell to me. I, I still think he's a good coach, but he's certainly hit, I think, a ceiling at Iowa State, and it's not the kind of ceiling that you want to hit. Uh, like he's hit a ceiling and it's a one story house. Uh, some of these other guys, they either have hit their ceiling, but like Mike Gundy, we know that he lives in a big ass house. Like his ceiling is, is fairly high there. And then other guys, uh, the ceiling in their house, they haven't gotten there yet, but that's cause they got a couple floors to go. So I think I'd go McGuire, Campbell, Brown, and then Aranda and Dykes were the other two. Uh, I would, I would take Dykes over Aranda. Aranda would be last. You guys know that I'm not a Dave Aranda guy. So I, I like your your house comparison. What I will say, you said there's some guys with only two stories, some guys with a lot of stories that just are not climbing those stairs yet. There's some dudes in here that don't even have a second floor. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. That's they're living in the trailer park of the Big 12 right now. <laughs> that is Satterfield, Satake. <laughs> yeah. Satterfield's in a cardboard box outside of some of these guys' houses. So <laughs> he's out. He's outside. He's outside a uh, Jeff Brom's house in Louisville. Just Scott Satterfield's out there, you know, asking for you know players in the portal or something, and uh, s- somebody comes by and like, Brett Yormark's like, "Hey, make real change, not spare change. We're not giving you any freebies here, and do it yourself." So uh, yeah, that's uh, to, your, to your point. I, I would have picked. I don't. My top two that I would have been a little bit torn between would be Matt Campbell and Joey McGuire. I know this is weird, but Matt Campbell's boring, so I would just pick Joey McGuire because of that. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I think that I would go McGuire too, just because I think that he probably has a higher peak at this point. I mean, yeah, outside of twenty twenty, I was. I almost, max I almost put Gus Malzahn into it too, but I didn't. I thought maybe that would be an easy pick. I don't know. Oh, Malzahn no, I would. I would probably had Malzahn second or third if you had thrown him into that mix. I wanted to make oh. him number one. Oh, I for sure would have had him number one. I can talk myself into Gus Malzahn. The other <laughs> ones, like it takes me a little bit to talk myself into it. Okay. Uh, last last fun one, and then we'll get out of here. This and it can never happen. So, like, the, just keep in mind this is just purely hypothetical. Of the the five the five guys that we have clearly established as the top, well, actually take take Willie Fritz out of it because new situation, whatever, get him mm-hmm. out of there. Of the four guys, Kleiman, Leipold, Gundy, and Whittingham, that are proven at the schools that they're at, and we think they're they're really good coaches. Uh, which of those four could have the fastest fall from grace and be off of that list of those four and out of a job at their current school? I, I think the obvious choice is Gundy. I think it's Gundy, too. I know some people were like, K-State fans with that little bias want to say, it's freaking Leipold because it's KU. I think it's Gundy because... Like, I think Leipold could stay there for 20 years there now if he wanted. And, and yeah, yeah. And, 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 and I still think there's probably still some questions about Leipold's ceiling, I think it's fair to say, especially losing Amy Kotelnicki. But I still feel confident in his floor. I can see the... We talk about Gundy as a big ass house. So I could see those floorboards getting a little weak, right? Yeah. That's yeah. What I, that's the way True. I see it. Yeah. I I think Gundy is probably the the best answer there. Uh just because like he also has not done anything to kind of calm down a tumultuous relationship at times with uh, Oklahoma State officials and everything. So uh Although, he certainly projects and he's he's come the closest to self-destructing that thing with you know either the way that his players talk about him or some of the things that he's done and he does have a, a little bit of the Bill Snyder Dabo Sweeney anywhere. It's like screw adjusting to the times. This is how we should do it. I do think he adapts better than those guys. I think he's like, well, crap, I have to do it, but he is very reluctant. So, yeah, I just, he's to be honest, what he's done the last four years is pretty incredible to me. Might be the best part of his career because I thought he was toast four years ago. So yeah. we could be talking here in five years saying we were freaking idiots again because he just figures out a way. But it just – at some point, like the recruiting seems to like – there was a real big change in their recruiting success. And I think it happened about two or three years ago. And that catches up to you at some point. And I think it will probably after this season when you don't have an Ollie Gordon just able to cover up for all the other mistakes that might be there. Yeah, no doubt about it. 
Uh, I'll, add, I'll add in a fun question. You know, you guys got your fun with your fun exercise. <laughs> so I'll, I'll throw in one of them. Then we can actually be, finish, wrap <laughs> this up. Uh, take away Scott Satterfield, because I think that he would be the obvious choice for all three of us. Who is the most likely to get fired? This season? Yes. Uh, I think... Sataki. Yeah, I'm I'm going to I'm going to say Dave Aranda. I, th- I think I th- Baylor Baylor might win. I don't think Baylor I don't think BYU has a chance to win. Yeah. I, I think I think that that's a good assessment. <laughs> I think it's Dave Aranda. I think if I think if Colorado, I think if you know the people that hired him and and they weren't probably big idiots out there, I think Deion Sanders probably and if he was at a real school would have the best chance of being canned. Uh but I think he's at a clown show. So yeah. I think it's Sataki because I think Baylor is a better chance of winning than BYU. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I, that'll 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 wrap it up. I got a crying kid, uh, so I don't want to, <laughs> you know, the neighbors be like, uh, "Are you going to stop that crying?" So I'm going to go take care of her. We're going to get out of here. Another uh, almost hour long show this week as we talk Big Twelve coaches. We'll be back again tomorrow with more content revolving around K State and the Big Twelve and. If you want updates on K-State recruiting, head over to kstateonline.com. Find us at On3. Football news right now. K-State gets the backup quarterback they're looking for in the portal, and basketball still hunts to fill out the rest of the roster. So for Drew Galloway and Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. We'll talk to you tomorrow. See ya.